right, we will sing Take Time to Be Holy. 656, we'll do verses 1, 2, and 4, if you can stand on the fourth verse. Dennis, would you mind praying for us? strength and comfort and healing and be with those who that only you know about as you know their their needs would ask that you be with those who are affected by flooding that everyone is safe and be with mark as he brings his message that he will bring words bring us closer to you christ let me pray amen our last song before the message will be living for jesus 605 We'll do verses 1 and 4, two times through. 605, verses 1 and 4.
us today, bright smiling faces, uh, eager to worship the Lord. Young people, you are dismissed to head downstairs for class time. We've made it all the way to chapter 6. And of course, chapter 6 is the story of Noah and the flood. Noah's Ark. How many of you have decorations around your house uh, of Noah or the Ark or something or another? I know that there's some people who collect those things and have many uh, different uh, depictions uh, of Noah's Ark. I mean, it's a children's story, right? It's one of those stories that uh, we have put on preschool walls and then all kind of happy elephants hanging their heads over top of the ark and everybody's smiling because it's a wonderful thing. But the reality of Noah's Ark that I want to spend a little bit of time today in uh, is what, how the story comes about. It's really kind of a dark story. Sometime this week, take a moment and tell somebody the story of Noah's Ark. And have that opportunity as you tell to listen to the things that you highlight in the story and the opportunity to see that Noah's Ark is not just a bunch of, of happy animals on a boat, uh, but uh, that there's a lot of devastation and a lot of judgment that comes with the story. So with that in mind, I want to see the context uh, of the story of Noah's Ark. If you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. In fact, we'll start there in chapter 5, kind of where we left off from chapter 4 with the story of Cain and Abel last week. But just to highlight a couple things that are there in the beginning uh, of chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a story, is a list of the generations uh, as it moves from Adam all the way down uh, into Noah. Uh, and as it starts there, it mentions there in verse 1 of chapter 5, this is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created the male and female and blessed them. And when he created them, he called them mankind. And so we have that story, even as it begins, that we're reminded of what it says at the beginning, that we're made in God's image and likeness. And we have to remember that as we get to this story uh, of the flood. <laughs> that we're made to be uh, communicating with God, to be in relationship with God. That God made humans in a special, different from the rest of creation, so that he could commune with them as he did with Adam and Eve there in the garden. And if you look through then the story of the different... Uh, men's names as they're listed there in chapter 5. Uh, you could count up the different years there and you would come to about 1,650 years later when we get to the story of the flood and of Noah. Now, and you may ask how many people could have been on this earth in 1,650 years and some estimates have had, had there could be at least anywhere from 750 million to even 4 billion people with the population increases uh, and it, we just don't know whether to be conservative with those estimates or not. But when we read the story of Noah's Ark, it's not just a story of 30 people who were sitting around a campfire who had this event happen to them. It's a worldwide situation with more than just the eight people who made it through the Ark and a few other people who were bystanders. We're talking about nations. We're talking about the entire world population. Lots of people. Uh, when we come to this story in this situation. With that background, let's read then Genesis chapter 6, and let's pick up there with verse 5, and then we'll go back and hit, uh, well, let's start with verse 1, and then we'll, uh, let's go all the way through. Verses 1 through 9, here we go. Genesis chapter 6, make the decision. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were heroes of old, men of renown. Verse 5, where I wanted to begin, Then the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become that in every inclination of the thoughts uh, of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. 
Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. And then it continues on talking a little bit more about the story there of who Noah was and who his family was and the connection that we know from a very familiar story with that. Uh, so as we read even that part of the story, how does that shed light on what the story is about? You know, as I read it over and over again the last few weeks and even in my preparation for this week's sermon, it's a pretty dark week for me. A lot of things happen and you look around the world and then you read verse 5 again. Uh, how, how is it that it says that? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. Reminds me a lot about what it says in the New Testament and about the world around us today. Uh, and then Matthew chapter 24 says, As it was in the days of Noah, talking about the return of Christ and the Son of Man, you read stories and you hear things that are happening in your life and you're like, Oh, this is heavy. This is difficult. How do we put this story in with the story of Noah's Ark? Uh, as you look at a few of the words there in verse 5, uh, there is some connections that could be made in context. He says the Lord saw uh, that uh, the earth that he had made had gone evil. Now we have to put that back into what it said in Genesis chapter 1 just a few uh, chapters ago when the Lord, after he created the earth, he saw it and he did what? After each day he called it very good. Uh, he called it good and we got to people. He saw them and when it was over he called them very good and now we have this contrast here in chapter 6. He sees the earth and it's not good. In fact, uh, notice the superlatives here. Every inclination of their hearts are only evil all of the time. And it's not just that well people were bad. That's not the point that the author is trying to get across is these wickedness reigned on the earth. Uh, and this is a bad situation that they find themselves in. Not just the actions that people did, but their thoughts behind their actions are what also was evil. That evil was holistically everywhere. That everyone was evil in every place all the time. We're reminded even of different places in Scripture that the Lord examines our mind. You're not a sinner, not because of what you allow people to see you do, but because of the decisions you made in your heart. Last week, we looked at the story of Cain and Abel, and the distinction was what? That Cain had a bad heart. That his motives were evil. That his decisions were evil. And sometimes we want to believe that it's only wrong if we do the wrong the hat is out there. But evil comes from within. It's part of our sin nature. And the decisions that we make, the motivations behind those decisions are also as they are opposed to God, evil in that way. And that's what God's calling out the situation of the world at this point. Only evil all of the time. What motivations do we have in our life? Motivations of preservation, of power, of manipulation, of significance. It makes you wonder, as we read those words, how bad it was. It was so bad that the next verse tells us that the Lord was sorry that he had made man. That he was grieved uh, in his heart. Sin is breaking God's laws. But sin is also breaking God's heart. God is offended. God is insulted because of the situation that he looks at the world and he sees of it. Now understand this. Human sin doesn't wound God emotionally. God is perfect and God is whole. He doesn't need the humans to act right so that he feels good about himself. That's not what it's trying to say. But it, it does affect him. It diminishes his plan and his power for, these, for us humans. And it makes him want to strike out judgment against them just as it does even today. When we sin, when we disobey God, there is an emotional response from God. Just as we read here in this story. How bad was it? We skipped over the verses that we read there at the very beginning. It was so bad that it gets really weird. Uh, the first four verses of Genesis chapter 4 talks about the sons of God and the Nephilim and the children who were great men of renown. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on those today because it's not necessarily a part of the story that I want to tell. But there's some weird things there. Some, this is the verse that those people on Ancient Aliens always want to quote you know, when it comes down to it. You know, the people with the tinfoil hats. you got to be careful. What is the Nephilim? What are the sons of God? What kind of creatures were around at one certain time? The reality is 
we don't have much certainty of putting those depictions together. Were they humans? Were they part? Were they uh, connected with angels? What spiritual beings was there a different class? We don't know. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But the evil was so bad that things had supernaturally gotten evil as well. Things had gotten so bad that God decided that he was going to change everything and start all over again. And we're reminded then that we have this conflict. We have this conflict between the world and the word. Remember, as God creates, he speaks. Uh, as Jesus comes, he is the representation of God. He is the word of God. So we have the world versus the world in this collision with people and God's plan. Now the world will teach you that you're a good enough person, that you have a good heart, and at least we're getting better and better. And if we have enough time, we can fix this world. But the Bible stands contradicting that. As we read the Bible, we see that the Bible says that people are bad and things don't get better. Things get worse. The world would tell us that it's religion and tradition that are binding us and holding us back. And we need to be liberated from those things. So the world would have us believe that if we get rid of traditional understandings of family, of sexuality, of marriage, of justice, and of human nature, that everything would be a better and okay. Again, it's been a rough week for me. <laughs> Look around. Things are not getting better. Things are, in some ways, very descriptive of Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, getting worse. Sin does not help society. It destroys it. It does not liberate. It enslaves. It unleashes hate. It unleashes violence. Do not be surprised at the world that you live in today. As God has pushed back and sin reigns more, Evil will take its have its day here on this earth as it has in the past. Genesis teaches us that God is good and people are bad. The world would have us believe that God is bad and people are good. Uh, you know, we try to make a statement on social media, try to stand up for God, try to help keep things in perspective. Uh, and it's amazing the way how quickly that our ideas have changed in this world. So when it's bad, you have to ask yourself the question. Is it God's fault, or is it our fault that it's bad? If it's God's fault that the world's bad, then humans could be a part of the solution. But if it's our fault that the world is bad, and it is, then God stands as the, the solution. So here we are, setting up the story of the flood, Genesis chapter 6. We have this collision. It's like God gives us uh, the keys of the car and asks us to move it around the driveway. So we bounce the car off the telephone pole, roll it over to a ditch, and set it ablaze and try to have some way to come back and tell Dad what happened to the situation uh, that he's given to us. We've messed things up royally. That's the story, the context uh, of the flood as we read here. So God's plan then is to destroy mankind. Uh, later on there in chapter 7, he sends the global flood. A flood that diminishes and gets rid of every kind of evil. That the only people who are saved, and we know the story, I'm not going to get into it, but in a lot of specifics, are Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. Eight people on the whole earth are the ones who get on board the boat that Noah spends 120 years making. While he preaches the gospel message, preaches a message to the world who was watching him build this boat in the middle of uh, a plane, uh, claiming that rain is going to happen, uh, and that with no evidence of this boat ever being able to float, day after day he takes with his sons to build this boat uh, and telling people that you better repent because God's going to send the flood. Pay attention. God's going to punish your evilness. And the only people who do are Noah. <clears throat> and his family, and God wipes out the rest of the planet. He gets rid of everything that breathes here on the earth. Anything on land, the birds, uh, the people, all of it is gone. It makes me ask this question as we make an application even to our own lives. Some of us need to have this same attitude towards sin in our life. I mean, what is your attitude towards sin? I mean, your sin that you have. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's like me and the weeds in my garden. Uh, and not my garden, I don't garden. Uh, in my flower bed. 
I walk by my flower bed and see a few weeds. I see a lot of weeds. I'm like, you know, I'm on my way. I'll pick a couple. I'll make it look good. It'll look just good enough so that if anybody happens to come, it won't be, I won't get them all. I'm not going to take the time. I'm not going to put the effort in. I'm not going to really get down there. I'm just going to pull the tops off of them. Really, because they're going to grow back anyway. Why worry about it? Sometimes we treat sin the same way. We'll just make it look good. We'll just briefly touch the surface of it. We'll just hide it from people so that they don't see it. But what God does with sin is he purges the earth from sin. And we read about that other times in Scripture, too. Remember the story of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount? What does he say? If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus takes getting rid of sin seriously, much more seriously, I would say, than what we do. It's a big deal, sin is. And we see that here in the story of the flood. The problem is that we allow sin to be a part of our life. We push it to the back where no one else sees. We dabble with sin. We flirt with sin. Don't keep sin around for a meaningless fling. Sin destroys. Sin dishonors. Sin alienates you from God. In the same way that God purged the earth, we need to purge our lives of sin. Get rid of it. Remove it. Clean it. Several times in the New Testament and other parts of Scripture, it talks about getting rid of sin. Colossians 3. But put off such things as anger and rage and slander and language. Hebrews 12. Let us get rid of the weight of sin that holds us down. Job chapter 11. If sin is in your hand, put it far away. 1 Peter chapter 2. So get rid of all evil and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. Envy. Throw it away. Get rid of the sins that we have. Don't play with them. Don't keep them around. Don't hang them in the closet for a rainy day. Sin is a big deal to God. So, as we get to the story, we have this entry. How bad the world is, the hero enters, right? Who's the hero of the story? We want to say Noah, right? But let me challenge you. No, it's not Noah. In fact, that was one of those words, that we, uh, one of those names where we were thinking about having uh, naming our children. We, one word that we didn't want to name them was Noah because we were with a certain uh, group of people. Uh, we were with uh, some kids in a preschool class, and uh, one of the boys was acting up, and all we found ourselves saying was, No, no, Noah, no, no. I thought that would be really confusing. And in the same way, I want you to think about this with the story. The hero of the story is not Noah. The hero of the story is God. God is the hero of the story. And sometimes, though, when it comes to the story of Noah's Ark, we want to tell us the story like there were bad people and there were good people, and God chose the good people to save the world. And so we're trying to say almost as if uh, the good person got a boat and the bad person had to swim, uh, so better take some swimming lessons or, or be good in that way. We try to scare and, and teach people in that way. When it tells us this part of Scripture, we're reminded that everyone on each earth was evil. That's the words that it used in verse 5, that evil was everywhere, and that includes Noah. Noah was not sinless. We know that. We understand that. But how then does Noah enter this story in this way? Everyone is evil, and then Noah comes in. And I don't want to get into a whole big discussion about total depravity and the Calvinistic way of thinking, but as, we, as I get a little older some of the times, it makes a little more sense of the scene how evil the world could be in that way. But God doesn't find a good Noah and then bless him. God chooses Noah, and Noah turns his heart to God. I highlight this point to dispel the belief that we are good without God. Many times that's what we want to believe. I'm okay. God just makes me better. No, 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 no. You're a sinner. You're evil. You are not good without God. But when God enters the story, Noah responds. Uh, and Noah, his faith uh, comes to be a part of it. Uh, the, the, and we have to understand that even in the stories that were a part of the news this week, I don't know if you picked up on some of these, uh, there's a story about John Gruden, uh, the ex-NFL football coach uh, of the Raiders and a few of the other teams last a year, maybe a couple years ago. He got canned mid-season because some of his emails came out that he was sending back and forth to people, uh, and it was sexist and it was racist, uh, and it was really bad. 
But there was a quote in, in this week uh, in uh, some of the news that I read where he came out and he said, the emails were shameful, but I'm a good person. I go to church. You know, he has that same idea about it. That if I'm not really that bad, I'm as good as you are, so that means that I'm okay. We have this understanding that we think that we're better than we really are. Another news article came about about a TikTok uh, off of TikTok with a Taco Bell manager talking about how hard it was uh, to get workers there. And then, of course, when you post a video, everybody thinks that it's their obligation to respond in whatever way they can. And here were some of the responses that were given. Well, no one wants to work minimum wage anymore. We know our worth. If it's not at least $18 an hour, another one said, it's not worth the time or the stress. Another one says, no one wants to work because we as human beings are tired of being disrespected by customers and management. What I get from all of this is this understanding. We think too highly of ourselves. We fool ourselves. We want to be the Noah in the story who is the nice guy around all the evil people. And God blesses us because we're nice. That's not how the story goes. God invites them all to respond to him. And Noah responds. And then we find some beautiful things that are said about Noah in that way. Sin destroys, and we emphatically ignore sometimes the sin that we have. We want to brush it off, and we want to lift ourselves higher and be foolish in some ways, like the story of the emperor in his new clothes. But what do we find here? What it does say about Noah, if you have your Bible still open, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. All right, let's start there with the one part where Noah is first introduced. Uh, verse 9, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Hebrews chapter 11, as we found Abel in Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter of faith, we also will find Noah there, and it's because he responds to God in faith. The great part about the story of the flood is that God comes around and he sends the invitation out and Noah is humble enough to respond. God picks you not because you're good but because he is. God doesn't want you on his team because you run faster than anybody else. God doesn't want you on his team because you look nicer than everybody else. God doesn't want you on your, his team because, you know, when it comes down to it, you sin less than everybody else. God wants you on his team because God is good. And he sends the invitation out to you, and it's up to you to respond to him. The earth was evil at that time. Noah stands out as the righteous person as he responds to God. The order is important there. God invites, Noah responds. What else can we learn about this story? Someone has listed several different things about Noah's Ark, but I just want to highlight a moment again, you know, a few things, a few nuggets that you can take uh, from the story of the flood. First thing is, plan ahead. <laughs> it wasn't raining when Noah began uh, to build the ark. Uh, stay fit. When you're 600 years old, the Bible tells us he was that old, someone might ask you to do something uh, really important. Don't listen to critics. Uh, do what you are called to do. Build on high ground. For safety's sake, travel in pairs. Uh, speed is not always the advantage. The cheetahs were on board the ark, but so were the snails. <laughs> if you can't fight or flee, at least float uh, in some way. Don't forget that we're all in the same boat. Remember that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic by professionals. I thought that was a pretty good line when it comes down to it. Remember that the woodpeckers inside are often a bigger threat than the storm that is outside. Don't necessarily, but there is some a little bit of truth as that. Uh, no matter how bleak it looks, that there's a rainbow on the other side. And don't miss the boat. Someone else has said in one of the other sermons, the reminder of what Noah did with his family, make sure your children are on the boat uh, as well. Respond in faith and let faith be uh, help you be a preacher of righteousness to this generation. Warn and tell them of the hope that is there. The story of the flood is a real bleak one. But as we were see Noah responding in faith, he did what the Lord asked him to do. Down to the moment. 
It, in fact, it says the other superlatives there that he did it exactly. Uh, and the commands are very specific. Build a boat this big. You do this dimensions. Have it ready this time. And you have to wonder if Noah didn't do everything exactly the way that God told him to do, would he have been saved in that way? We don't know the other side of that. But it's a reminder for us. When God tells us to do something, when he gives us the instructions, he's not just saying, pick what you want to. <laughs> Do your best. No. Faith, showing your faith to God is being obedience to Him and believing no matter how crazy the circumstance looks from the outside, that God has it covered. And you will be put into an awkward situation because of your faith to highlight your reliance and dependence on God. You will. You'll have to make that decision. Am I going to go back and trust myself or am I just going to trust God? But if you trust God, we know how the story ends. If you have your Bible still open, let's go to Genesis chapter uh, 9. Uh, it gets all the way through the story of the flood, uh, and they make it to the other part after the rain comes and uh, the waters start to recede, and he puts out the birds. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, uh, verses 11 and following says this, I will establish my covenant with you, Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant. I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The best part of the story of the flood is that God comes back and saves. And that God provides again. And that God, remember the sea words that we talked about a few weeks ago? Adam and Eve, he had a covenant with him in the garden. We have that word come up again. A covenant, an agreement between God and humanity. God wants their relationship with us. And as we follow him in faith, he reestablishes this covenant with Noah and with people. Promising never again to destroy the earth in that way. Uh, the rainbow is there and for that reminder of that promise. And unfortunately, it's lost its significance in recent years, but it still stands there to show us that what God will do when we get rid of the sin. And we have the archetype, even as the New Testament tells us, that Noah's flood is a cleansing of our sin as we are reminded of our own sins being cleansed through the waters of baptism. And the promise that God gives us by being saved through him is not just a rainbow, but as we read the story in Revelation, we're reminded of that communication and how beautiful it will be one day when we are with God forever and ever. The story of the flood is your story. But it's a serious story. Don't just read the story of the flood and be like, and some people were bad and Noah was good and then there were rainbows. No. Read the story and see God hates sin. God punishes sin. The story of every Christian is not just a story about follow God and go to heaven. It's follow God, get rid of sin. There is a judgment waiting for those who don't get rid of sin. There's a completeness in the story that we have to connect here in our own lives with the story that is found here in Genesis chapter 6. But as we follow in faith, we can have it say what it said of Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God comes in and offers grace. Your sin, the wages of sin, gives judgment. But God steps in and gives grace. God comes in and reestablishes his covenant if you respond to him in faith. We come to the time in our service to say, okay, God, what now? What are we going to do? The good news is, just as God does here in Genesis chapter 9, He gives the world a fresh start. Oh, the beauty after a long, hard rain, right? Uh, when the, the warm sun comes out in, in the spring, uh, after the rain has been here for a while, and everything starts to grow and be refreshed again, that's also the story of your life. When we come to God and ask for forgiveness from our sins and we respond in faith, letting Jesus take the punishment of our sin because the punishment of our sin still has to be dealt with. And that's why God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. If we let Jesus have that punishment, we are brought back into that relationship with him. 
What decisions do you need to make for the Lord today? A story and an opportunity of finding Jesus through baptism, the opportunity of repenting of your sins, the opportunity of just trying to take steps of faith, <coughs> believing that God will do what He said that He will do and make the promise for you. And maybe you're going to be out there for 120 years trying to build a boat and, and trying to do something that everyone else doesn't seem to make any sense at all in your life. But if you stay firm to the Lord in your faith by your obedience to Him, He will provide. That's the story of the grace of God. If you need to respond to the Lord Jesus. Our hymn of decision is number 638, I Need Thee at Reality. Let's stand. Uh, let's sing the first verse. Uh, if you need to respond to the Lord, come forward as we stand and sing.
it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Let's pray. September the 25th uh, in the afternoon and evening we'll start uh, it says details to come I'm just throwing it out there about 3 30 or so uh, and then we'll have our evening meal out there together and kind of be the smooth and, and we need food. somebody that's good at bags to show up and beat Bobby so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it'll just be an opportunity to hang out so if you have some outdoor games you want to bring out we'll have a pavilion out there uh, and, and have a chance to Enjoy one another's company uh, out there. September the 25th, it's in the bulletin. I kind of mark that date down. It's a Sunday afternoon to go meet out the park and spend some time together that way. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Let's stand. Close with our prayer. And then we'll Father God, thank you for who you are for what you have done in our life. Lord, we thank you for the people that you've surrounded us with that would, can help encourage our hearts and worship you. We thank you for those who've taught us uh, what it means to follow after you. And we pray, Lord, for this generation uh, that you can raise up teachers and use us as we have the opportunity to show your love and, and to let your love be seen and, and taken hold in your lives as well. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Please forgive us of our sins as a nation. Please forgive us of our sins as, as the world. Please forgive us even in our families. Help us, Lord, to offer that forgiveness to one another as well. Uh, please, Lord, help us to be the witness of your love and grace as your church. We pray for those who are not able to be with us and ask that you continue to give them guidance uh, and love and acceptance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.